You ever get like a single lyric stuck in your head? Not like a whole song, not like a melodic idea, just sort of the words. Because that happens to me with honestly alarming regularity. A phrase will get stuck in my head and I'll kind of just spend weeks turning it over, inspecting its little intricacies, trying to figure out any meaning I can pull from it. I guess that's one of the reasons why I sort of, you know, do what I do. Lately, there's been one particular lyric stuck in my head and I wanted to kind of talk you guys through it. You know, I could do a big cliffhanger here, but let's be honest, you click the thumbnail, you know it's gonna be Bowie, you know it's gonna be Changes, and if you know it's Changes, you probably know what line it is. And these children that you spit on as they try to change their worlds are immune to your consultations. They're quite aware of what they're going through. It's not the most cryptic line. It's, it's quite literal, actually. You know, it's pretty obvious what it's about. And I'm far from the first person to note that it's an important and relevant line. John Hughes used it at the end of The Breakfast Club. But, you know, as simple as its meaning is, it brings up a lot of things that I've sort of wanted to talk about for a long time about about Bowie's generation, about my generation, about the world right now, and about the discourse right now. So, you know, let's let's drop the title and then get into it a little. Before I can jump fully into my rants about this, we need to enter my favorite part, the cultural context. This is, this is my jam. I love this shit. David Bowie was born just as modern youth culture was hitting the Western world. There had been notable youth movements earlier in the century, but the baby boom was something different. The devastation of two world wars along with the economic boom of peacetime meant that Bowie's generation outnumbered their parents to a degree that really hadn't been seen before. And this enormous demographic shift coincided with a moment of technological revolution. Mass media really took off for the first time as televisions entered homes and a rich cultural exchange began between the former allied powers. All these factors conspired to create a cultural shift that absolutely shook the world, and particularly shook England as the British Empire started its decline. Bowie's generation asserted themselves in fashion, art, culture, and politics, and the older generations saw this as an affront. In America, the de facto leader of this youth movement was Bob Dylan, who surged into popularity in 1963, earning the label of the voice of a generation. One of the reasons for that label was the way Dylan spoke about youth and young people. Just look at 1964's My Back Pages, which features the iconic line, I was so much older than, I'm younger than that now a piece that inverts the traditional concepts of age and wisdom and implies that the youth might know better than their elders. Then there's Dylan's famous 1965 press conference in San Francisco, which saw him sniping at an older music press who were trying to understand him and gave us this eternal gem. Mr. Dylan, I know you uh, dislike labels and probably rightly so, but uh, for those, those of us who are well over 30, could you uh, label yourself and perhaps uh, tell us what your role is? Well... Sort of label myself as well under 30. <laughs> um, and my role is to, uh, you know, to just uh, stay here as long as I can. <laughs> as Dylan was making his stir, the teenage Bowie was trying to find his footing in the British music scene and trying to assert himself as an important member of the youth movement. To that end, a 17-year-old Bowie founded the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Long-Haired Men, who were featured on the BBC program Tonight. It's all got to stop. They've had enough. The worms are turning. The rebellion of the long hairs is getting underway. They're tired of persecution. They're tired of taunts. They're tired of losing their jobs. They're tired of being sent home from college. They're tired of being sent home from school. They're tired even of being refused the dole. So with the nucleus of uh, some of his friends, a 17-year-old, Davy Jones, has just founded the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Long-Haired Men. When was the last time that any of you ever went to a barber? Three years ago. Three years? I went several years oh, ago. 
Don't worry, guys. Look, exactly <laughs> how are you going to stop people being cruel to you? Come on, that's your idea. Well, uh, if anybody is chucked out of a factory job or uh, removed from a public bar or saloon bar, um, you'll get a petition written up and sent to the, either the LCC, the people that hold the publicity. Now, this society was more of a PR move to try to get some attention for his band, the Manish Boys, who were sort of a pretty generic, honestly, British invasion group. But the interview does get at genuine divides that were emerging in this society. Hair politics was a very real thing in the 60s, with the Beatles haircuts coming under constant scrutiny. And as the decade rolled on, the hair would only get longer and the generational tension would increase. By the end of the 60s, there were overt clashes between hippies and cops in the streets of America, and it seemed that this generational war might be pushing toward full-on revolution. The peaceful dreams of the 60s had turned bloody, and the future seemed uncertain. It's on this backdrop that Bowie set out to work on Hunky Dory, an album that was deeply influenced by his experiences touring in America. The album even featured an ode to the one-time figurehead of the youth movement, Bob Dylan. By this point, Dylan had tried to escape fame and drop off the map, and Bowie saw an opportunity in that. He believed that he could take up the mantle and speak for his generation. In a 1976 interview with Melody Maker, he explained his vision with Song for Bob Dylan. That laid out what I wanted to do in rock. It was at that period that I said, Okay, Dylan, if you don't want to do it, I will. I saw the leadership void. Even though the song isn't one of the most important on the album, it represented for me what the album was all about. If there wasn't someone who was going to use rock and roll, then I'd do it. And that ethos bleeds very clearly into changes. With all that in mind, and with kind of, you know, the cultural conception of Bowie now, you might think that in 1971, when Bowie released Changes, he was already kind of a voice for the youth culture. And he was trying to be, but honestly, he, he really was not having a ton of success. Bowie spent a lot of his early career, you know, working with different musical projects, different film projects, all of this different stuff, kind of desperately trying to break through to fame. But he kind of couldn't. His first album did miserably. He scored a hit with Space Oddity, and the BBC used that in its coverage of the Apollo programs, which honestly, like, bad choice, BBC. Read the lyrics. It's about an astronaut dying in space. It's a little morbid. But that wasn't really actually able to break him through and find the success that he wanted. You know, he released this album and it it didn't do very well. It didn't sell very well. People didn't really know how to market Bowie. He was really trying for fame and really trying for success, but he just didn't have the juice yet or the time wasn't ripe. And a lot of that is actually sort of what he's talking about in the rest of Changes. He talks about his struggles trying to create these identities, trying to find a market for his music, trying to find an audience for his music, and trying to connect with the people. And he's already very sort of aware of the ephemeral nature of fame and success, and especially of sort of the strange nature of youth culture as it ties into all of this. People have noted that the sort of stutter, the ch ch, -ch changes, the ch ch, -ch changes, the ch ch, -ch changes. I, I I don't know. I, I can't sing Bowie. I can I can't even sing me. I can't sing Bowie. The sort of stuttering in the chorus feels like it might be a reference to the Who's My Generation, you know, a song with the the famous lines, Hope I die before I get old. And again, another point to the fact that it might be in dialogue with my generation is the line later, look out you rock and rollers, pretty soon you're going to get older. So with all of this context, I think we can start to understand the line that we're all here to talk about. Bowie is clearly directing shade at an older generation that were questioning all of the change without trying to understand the youth. But the line runs deeper than just Bowie's generation. It taps into a sort of universal experience. You know, there's all of these memes that pull up quotes from people saying the new generation is lazy and entitled or whatever, dating back to, like, the ancient Greeks. So Bowie is speaking to an experience that young people have always had and continue to have to this day. And the relevance of this line in the modern age is what's really got it stuck in my head. Because the parallels between Bowie's moment and ours are very real. In Bowie's time, he was fresh out of a sexual revolution. People were pushing gender and sexual dynamics, and people were being told, you don't know 
what's going on with you. And, and, you know, in our age, I think one of, one of the most important fights happening right now is the fight for trans rights, the fight for queer rights. People are actively breaking down constructions of gender identity and sexuality that have failed them. They're really breaking down these strict confines of gender roles that, you know, have created this whole fucking toxic thing in the first place. And they're being said, you're, you're confused. You don't understand. I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm worried that this person doesn't really understand what they're going through. Oh, they understand. Believe me, the, the kids know what they're going through. They understand that these social constructs have failed them. They failed all of us. And they continue to fail all of us. So the only thing we can do with them is break them down. You know, I think that one of the big things that anyone who is queer has ever experienced, or honestly, not even queer, anyone that kind of has tried to assert their identity as a young person, anyone who's ever tried to do that has gotten, you don't, you don't really know, you're just a kid, you don't understand the world. You know, I'm, I'm a millennial. Um, I, I'm sort of peak millennial. I was born in 93. All of your millennial milestones, I've got them. I was, um, I was, I was a hipster. I wear ankle socks sometimes. I don't, I, I don't actually really have a sock preference, except I don't wear socks if, if I can't see, see, I'm barefoot now. That's, that's a freebie for all of you at Wikifeet. Uh, God, this is unhinged. And you know, as a millennial, when I was younger, I always resonated with Bowie's words because I was not quite spit on. You know, the vitriol wasn't quite the same as the traumatized World War II vets hating their children. But I experienced a lot of vitriol. All of my generation did, you know, for saying things like, hey, maybe this late capitalist hellscape isn't good. And for trying to, you know, explore our own experiences with mental illness. You know, anxiety is something I deal with. It's something basically everyone I know deals with because we kind of grew up with our brains hooked into giant corporate anxiety networks. Um, so, you know, so often I've kind of bumped against this, oh, but you don't know. You'll understand when you get older. I mean, one of the ones that I got I got so, so often was you'll be more conservative when you're older. You'll, you know, you'll, you'll grow out of this. And y y y I, I don't, if you've talked to me at any parties lately, yeah, I'm not, I'm not more conservative. Um, I'll say that much, but all of that, the, the millennials killing this, the rage at millennials, I'm, I'm kind of over that. Um, cause it's no longer coming at us. Now it's coming at the next generation, Gen Z, Gen Alpha. And what I really hate about that is that I see these same things coming at Gen Alpha from people who are my age, you know, from, from people who went through very recently being told our opinions don't matter, being told our culture is stupid, being told we don't understand the world. And now we're just kind of repeating that cycle. And you'll, you know, thinking about this, of, of course we are, because that's exactly what happened with our parents' generation. You know, they were radical counterculture. I mean, the, the extent to which, like, most boomers were not hippies, but, you know, they asserted a lot of things that pissed off their parents. Even if they weren't hippies, they had their own rebellions, whether that was, you know, not being as religious as their parents, whether that was going through divorces, you know, that's, that's a big thing. Uh, women entering the workforce was a big thing that a lot of older generations spin on. But then what happens is it becomes this cyclical thing. One way or another, we all kind of form the habits of the elders who raise us. And that means that if we are getting spat on when we're young, what we're going to do is turn around and spit on the next generation. And I think it's horrible. I hate that. I, I, I really want this cycle to end. I see this culture war discourse around generational conflicts, and it's fucking exhausting. It, it is so stupid, it gets me, as you can see, it gets me riled up and makes me do unhinged rant videos like this. Because, like, yeah, there are things that kids don't know, but there are also things adults don't know. I don't know what the fuck is happening over on TikTok, and that's important. Here's the thing. It's okay not to get the kids. It's good not to get the kids. It's okay that I don't, I don't know the Gen Z lingo because 
it's not mine. It shouldn't be mine. And I think this is one of the problems where I think a lot of millennials are sort of struggling to cope with the fact that we are not youth culture anymore. And I think that's because economically, millennials have been denied so many of the markers of adulthood as we understood it. Millennials rightfully feel a lack of power. We feel like we are in this world that is kind of scary and dying and being controlled by brutal corporate forces, and there's not much we can do about it. And I think when people lack power, one of the simplest things that you can do to get a sense of power is to find a group that has less power than you. It's, it's a tale as old as time. It's a really ugly human instinct, but it's very real. And I think younger generations are almost always a good target for this because young people don't tend to have a lot of power, at least not economically, not politically, but where they do have power is culturally. Youth in the modern age drives culture. And I think that, you know, millennials feel the power that we had there slipping away. And so to try to get a hold of it, we turn to these tried and true multi-generational tactics of spitting on the youth, of saying, your culture is stupid. I don't like your culture. You'll, your culture doesn't make sense. And f fuck that, right? <sighs> I, get, I get really worked up about this. Sorry, camera. I'm shouting at you a lot. <sighs> I just think it's stupid, you know? Like, like... Really, that's all this rant is, is I think it's incredibly stupid for us to be condescending toward a younger generation that's doing really incredible stuff. A younger generation that's more politically involved than we ever were at that age. You know, a younger generation that is more culturally literate than we were. I mean, there are, there are issues and there are things that need to be addressed, but th the sheer amount of music that this generation has listened to, the sheer amount of art that they have consumed growing up in the digital age. Why are we getting so caught up in, oh, they used stupid slang that's different than the stupid slang that we used? Like, let, let kids be kids. These children that you spit on as they try to change their world are immune to your consultations. They're quite aware what they're going through. I don't need to tell a young kid that they don't know yet, that they don't know what the world is, because I don't know. I don't know what it is for my entire life to be in a post-algorithm world. You know, like, like the experiences and challenges that the younger generation are going through, it's their own challenge. I can give wisdom and I can try to do my best to advise. I, I don't think, you know, you know, I think sharing of intergenerational wisdom is a really important thing. And I think that's actually something that gets lost in these focuses on generational wars. I think that what a lot of us want as we grow older is to be able to share the lessons that we've learned from being a human with people who are younger and hopefully, you know, make it easier for them to be a human. Because being a human fucking sucks. It's hard. But I think, you know, so often that energy is channeled in the wrong way and is miscommunicated it's spent telling people how they should be living their life rather than listening to them about what they're going through in their life and trying to understand and empathize and provide support where you can. I understand the impulse. It's, it's a cheap thrill. There is stuff that goes viral that seems like the stupidest shit on earth to me. But, like, who cares? Who cares? I live in a different life. I've... I consume different culture. I, I've grown up in a different world. So yeah, of course I'm not going to get some of this stuff. The thing is, I don't know if these are genuine problems or if this is just something amplified by my own hellish bubble in the algorithm, but I see this shit all the time and it's exhausting. So what I wanted to sort of say with this is that this is eternal, and this cycle will continue as long as we let it continue, you know? As long as the older generation, you know, says to the younger generation, oh, what you like is weird and stupid, and I don't understand it, then when that younger generation grows up, they're probably going to do the same thing, because that's how we learn. And because it makes you feel 
good and superior for five seconds. I guess what I'm trying to say is that next time you go to spit on a child, think about it. You know, they they know what they're going through. They understand their world. Try to ask them about their world. Try to try to understand their world. I I find I find it fun. You know, I find it useful. I think it I think it helps. And here's the thing. Throughout this video, I've thrown a lot of hate at the older generation. The reality is, so many of the older generation are going through the same shit we are. They're living in the similar economic reality. Yes, they had more wealth growing up, but so many of them are needing to work post-retirement. So many of them are seeing our healthcare systems fail them as they reach their age. The generational wars are an absolute scam. They exist to break down solidarity that people have with each other. And to the same degree that we wish older people would listen to our concerns, we also need to listen to them and need to come to the table and just stop it with this, frankly, ironically, given what this all is about, it's childish bullshit. Who gives a shit if someone says groovy or tight or skibbity? I why did I choose tight for my millennial? I don't know what my millennial slang is. You probably know it more than me. You watch my videos. I'm vaguely aware of it. I don't watch my videos. They're bad. Especially this one. <laughs> to bring this all back full circle and back to the man that we're all here to talk about, David Bowie, I think that part of his success as an artist, as a social influencer, as a person is that he was aware of this stuff. Throughout his entire career, he was aware of this stuff. His sort of chameleon persona happened because he was always able to look at what was going on in the music world and what was going on with the youth. He always had his ear on what was coming up from young people, what was new, what was happening, what was exciting. And that's part of what gave him this long career. He knew that he was going to get older. And at the end of his life, you know, when he was literally on death's doorstep, he was not doing a nostalgia act. I mean, his, his second last album, The Next Day, is literally about breaking free from kind of the trap of nostalgia and becoming a, a better person, continuing to push, continuing to embrace new stuff. And he did that quite literally right up until the end. And that's why he's one of my favorite creatives. You know, that's why I have Bowie shit all over my set is because I think he's someone who was able to adapt to the times and someone who was able to also use his platform to speak out. You know, I'm working on my music video history series right now and there's a whole clip of him calling out the racism of early MTV at a time when, by that point, he was kind of a legacy act. He was a successful rocker who, he had no need to throw himself in this, but he saw incredible work by young, exciting black artists and spoke up to try to platform them. That's that's the attitude that I want us to have with the younger generation. I want us, I want us to support the younger generation and, and create coalitions of solidarity where we can build a better world together. Okay, so I might be having to come to terms with the fact that I am not young anymore, but that doesn't mean that I can't keep some youthful energy. And I think the best way to do that, the best way to feel fresh, is to continue learning new things. To that end, I've actually been starting to move toward working on my own music again, uh, which is something I haven't done since I was, you know, genuinely part of the youth. And so for that journey, I'm going to turn to Skillshare. Skillshare is a fantastic online learning platform with classes on all sorts of topics. Whether you're looking to experiment creatively and learn music, illustration, design, or whether you're looking to advance professionally and work on freelance skills or productivity skills, Skillshare's got it. Personally, the first one I'm going to check out is Jacob Collier's class on music fundamentals, because I think that'll help me, you know, get my music skills back on track if I'm genuinely going to do this thing. 
If you want to join me in this learning journey, you can do so at absolutely no cost to yourself. The first 500 people to click the link in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare. And on top of that, you'll just be doing a lot to help support my channel. So why not check it out? You know, it's, it's fun to learn new things. It's fun to try to improve ourselves. Once again, check out the link in the description, support the channel, and thanks for watching.